So imagine this with me. Johnny Depp is accused of monstrous deeds by his soon-to-be ex, and then two months later, she meets with him in a hotel room. Sounds like something that would utterly devastate all of her claims, doesn't it? So hey there. Now before we get to the details of this, and my, there's some interesting details, this is our second comic. Link is in the description, and we have less than a week left on this. Now we need your help getting the word out because we cover this kind of stuff, and yeah, we can't get any coverage for this. Basically, we're supposed to fail. But you know what? We don't fail because of people like you. Thank you for checking it out. So in order to accurately understand just how bombshell this revelation is, understand the timeline that this fits into. Now, these are A.H.'s own words, talking about May 21st, 2016, in which she details Johnny Depp getting home, becoming increasingly enraged, and, quote, he then grabbed a cell phone, wound up his arm like a baseball pitcher, and threw the cell phone at me, striking my cheek and eye with great force. From there, on May 23rd, you have A.H. filing for divorce. That's just days after Johnny Depp's mother passes away. May 24th, you have her lawyer sending what is essentially an extortion letter that basically says, if you don't go out and give us what we want, we're going to put all of this stuff public. May 27th, Johnny Depp says, yeah, that's not going to happen. And on May 27th, also, A.H. makes good on those threats by telling you essentially how she fears for her life. Literally saying that, mind you, that she fears. I live in fear that Johnny will return to blank residence unannounced to terrorize me physically and emotionally. I require the protection of this court via the issuance of a DVRO. So she's telling them, I need this because I can't be around this guy because he is a monster. So imagine a revelation about a recording that was made by A.H. on July 22, 2016, months after this filing, that basically was taken of the two of them meeting, and context was in a hotel room. Now, I want to give props to Nick Wallace, too, on Twitter for capturing all of this stuff. Props to you in that. I definitely donated to you for this stuff because, yes, great stuff here. So there was a recording made by A.H. on July 22, 2016. In July 2016, where had the proceedings in America gotten to? So Johnny Depp said, A.H. had filed for divorce, and then she filed for a restraining order against me. And at the time, I was on tour with my band, and we had a show in San Francisco, and that's where we were. So you heard that A.H. had filed for a restraining order. What was the basis for that restraining order? In just one sentence. Now, the judge interjects in this, saying, hey, we know about this, to which he is answered, yes, we know that she made it on the basis of DV by you, and that she was in fear of her life. Again, that is illustrated right there in the points. So Johnny Depp, he concurs with this, saying, yeah, you know, that is the reason that she filed that. I knew about it then. So then he's asked, then you had a meeting. Who requested this meeting? Johnny Depp says, oh, A.H. did that. Huh. So A.H., in fear for her life, decided that she was going to meet with Johnny Depp. Interesting, huh? Johnny Depp continues, I just rented a room so that we could talk. It was just the two of us. So not only did they meet, but they met in a rented room and there were only two of them there. Hmm, sounds like someone is definitely in fear for their life, huh? Then Johnny Depp, he has asked something that I think is really spot on. A.H. had obtained a restraining order against you. Did she make sure she stayed at least 10 feet away from you at all times? And you know, A.H., one of the things that she does all the time is saying, hey, I didn't know about what was going on there. I didn't know that this stuff actually pertained to me. Well, this is the signature off the restraining order. You can see the date on it. You can see her name. And you can see a lawyer name here as well. I have read the restraining order on the back of the summons, and I understand that they apply to me when this petition is filed. So I understand that, and I declare under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of California that the foregoing is true and correct. So she fears for her life. She's going to maintain distance because, again, Johnny Depp is a monster under penalty of perjury 
Now, Johnny Depp's reply to that, talking about that distancing again, was no, sir, she did not. Why didn't she there? Well, there was a lot of discussion about what was going on, and at times it got emotional, and she asked for a hug. I mean, that is so emotionally manipulative in that. So he was asked, did you embrace her? Johnny Depp said, no, I don't think it was right given the circumstances. If she had told the world she was in fear of her life from me, and I'd been this horrible monster, if you will. I did not see why she would want to touch me. You know, on the other side of that, too, I wouldn't want to go out and to try to embrace her there because God knows you might actually wind up your arms like a baseball pitcher and go in with an assault hug or something. (laughs) So then he's asked, was it a long discussion in the hotel bedroom? Johnny Depp says, yes, it was quite a long discussion. And at a certain point, A.H. just looked exhausted and complained of palpitations and wasn't feeling well. I suggested she take a nap for a couple of hours. I took her into the bedroom of the hotel room, pulled down the sheets, got her into bed, but before I did, she asked if I would get into bed for a cuddle, and I said no, I would not. So, I mean, think about that situation there, too. Again, she has accused somebody of being a monster. She's meeting with them in a hotel room here. There is no one else around, and at a certain point, she says, you know what? I'm going to go lay down in the bed. Not only am I going to lay down in the bed, but why don't you come in here and join me for a cuddle? You know, because I fear for my life when I'm around you. Now, Johnny Depp continues with this, and I thought this was rather sad. So I walked back into the living room and sat down and tried to make sense of everything, giving all of the circumstances surrounding our lives and my life at the time. It was very emotional time, and I just sat and I cried. I mean, really, look at how emotionally manipulative this entire situation is. You have somebody being destroyed by someone that they care about, and they have been called the worst thing that you can call someone in society just a couple of months ago. Then they want to meet. Then they need a hug. Then they need a cuddle. You know where exactly this would have gone. What would have happened if Johnny Depp went down that road? See that? That's a scary question when you get down to it. But also, this stuff you can see in a statement like this, this stuff will break you as well. Now, Johnny Depp is then asked something that I would have loved to see the reversal to as well. He was asked, did at any time A.H. appear scared of you? Now, Johnny Depp, he answers no, sir, to that. And I wonder if he was asked in this situation, how did you feel being around A.H.? Were you scared of her? I mean, you had been accused of all of this stuff. You've lost a finger. You've had a cigarette put out on your face and more. How were you feeling when you were there? I wonder what that answer would have been. So that is what's happening behind the scenes. While on public record, this is what A.H. is acknowledging. Johnny and I began living together in or about 2012, and we were married on February the 3rd, 2015. We did not have any children together. During the entirety of our relationship, Johnny had been verbally and physically abusive to me. I endured excessive emotional, verbal, and physical abuse from Johnny, which had included angry, hostile, humiliating, and threatening assaults to me whenever I questioned his authority or disagreed with him. Johnny has a long-held and widely acknowledged uh, public and private history of drug and alcohol abuse. He has a short fuse. He is often paranoid, and his temper is exceptionally scary for me, as it has proven many times to be physically dangerous and or life-threatening to me. Johnny's relationship with reality oscillates depending upon his interaction with alcohol and drugs. As Johnny Johnny's paranoia, delusions, and aggression increase throughout our relationship, so is my awareness of his continued substance abuse. Because of this, I am extremely afraid of Johnny and for my safety. I am petrified he will return at any moment to the residence to which he has full access to, despite my repeated pleas to his security team to prevent otherwise and to protect me if restraining order are not immediately issued. I strongly believe that in addition to the DVRO, Johnny also requires enrollment in anger management courses and a batterer's intervention program. She then details two events, and I want to preface this with this statement. There is not enough time between these and a July meeting to truly have nostalgia in her. You know, this would have been fresh in your mind. So on the 21st of April 2016, she was celebrating her birthday with friends at the Blank Residence. As everyone was preparing to leave my birthday party, Johnny showed up inebriated and high. 
After my guests had left, Johnny and I had a discussion about his absence for my birthday celebration, which deteriorated into a bad argument that started with Johnny throwing a magnum-sized bottle of champagne at a wall and a wine glass on me and the floor, both of which shattered. Johnny then grabbed me by the shoulders, pushed me to the bed, blocking the bedroom door. He then grabbed me by the hair and violently shoved me to the floor. Johnny was also screaming and threatening me, taunting me to stand up. After several minutes, Johnny stormed out of the condominium, but not before tossing aside and breaking nearly everything in his path. I did not see him again for another month. Next time was May 21st, 2016. He enters this place here, 7.15 p.m., inebriated and high. At the time of Johnny's arrival, my friend Elizabeth Martz was present. This person is going to give testimony, along with Raquel Pennington. This person is also going to give testimony, and her fiancé, Josh Drew, who is also going to give that in this trial, who live in the adjacent apartment at Blank Residence. When Johnny arrived at first, we were having a peaceful conversation in the living room, talking about his mother's passing as I tried to cover it him while we sat on the couch. Suddenly, he began obsessing about something that was untrue, and his demeanor changed dramatically. This is talking about the pooping incident here. He became extremely angry. I tried to calm Johnny down by calling one of his trusted employees, talking about the person who actually knows about the pooping incident, to alleviate his misplaced concerns, but it did not work. It did not work because, well, that person (laughs) tells you, yes, this stuff was actually true. Johnny was becoming increasingly enraged. I began having concerns for my safety and sent a text to my friend, Raquel, who was uh, in the condominium next door. I texted her and asked her to come over. As Johnny continued to rant in an aggressive and incoherent manner, he demanded that we call Io Tillett Wright to prove his paranoia and irrational accusations about some delusional idea he was having, aka they know about the Poopgate incident. As my call to Io went through on the speakerphone, Johnny ripped the cell phone from my hand and began screaming profanities and insults at Io. I heard Io yell for me to get out of the house. Johnny then grabbed the cell phone, wound up his arm like a baseball pitcher, and threw the cell phone at me, striking my cheek and eye with great force. Now, there's other claims in here, too. You see all of this stuff talking about what type of monster he is, how she feels unsafe. She needs the authority of the law to to keep this man away, and yet she is meeting with him just two months later in a hotel room asking to cuddle. I mean, seriously, think about that stuff. See, that is the scariest thing about believing all accusations. You don't know part of the time whether you're taking up for a victim or you're creating a new one. But anyway, you tell me what you think about this stuff. So to close, this is our comic book, another case for the littlest umbrella, 40 pages of full color, all ages love crafty and extravaganza, less than a week remaining, and we're only eight backers away from 1800. Now this success, you would have people talk about it out there in the media if this was attributed to a mainstream professional. But since we do it and we talk about things like you just saw, yeah, we're wrong thinkers, therefore we need to be shut down. But people like yourself has helped us keep this going, and this, it allows allows us to say sponsor free, challenge a mainstream that has forgotten things, keep the crazies in their place, and make a great comic book. So join us in that. Also, let me say thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up. You empower endeavors. People should thank you. They rarely do. So I want to say that. Thank you. I appreciate you. And until next time, see you soon.